Luke chapter 16 gives us what is probably very familiar to many of us. It, I have said before, I've been in full-time ministry over 20 years, around 21, 22 years, and I've said several times in that span that this text may be my favorite New Testament passage for a variety of reasons, and, um, and, and in part, it could be because an evangelist friend of mine, the first sermon he ever preached, he was 17, a freshman in, 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 at Ambassador Baptist Bible College, I was about 14, and I heard him preach this text in uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and it impacted me greatly. Could be that that is one reason why, that this is my favorite text, Luke 16, 19 and following. Uh, could be just because of its content and really the alarm that is present in the text. Many reasons. But this text has impacted me uh, in a significant and substantial way. And I hope that it will impact you as well. And again, I know it's pretty familiar to many of us. But in spite of its familiarity, I hope that you will ask the Lord to speak to you through this text. If you haven't as of yet asked God to speak to you, will you do that? Before we dive into thus saith the Lord. Um, let me ask you a question here. Uh, and before I ask you the question, I, I just want to remind you if, you, if you were paying attention during the scripture reading, this text has to do with hell. This is... Jesus' teaching about the rich man and Lazarus and the rich man ending up in hell. And I know that hell is a, an uncomfortable thing for people to consider. So understanding the text and the ideas of the text, this is the question. Uh, who said the following statements? I'm going to give you, it's a little bit of a quiz here, first thing, uh, in the more, at the outset of the sermon here. A little bit of a quiz. Identify the author of the following quotes, and I'm going to give you four options. Was it Pharaoh? Was it Nero? Was it Mohammed? Or was it Hitler? Here are the quotes. Cast these unprofitable or worthless servants into outer darkness. The next quote is this. Get out of my presence, ye damned, and go to the fire that will burn forever. Was it Pharaoh, Nero, Mohammed, or Hitler? Well, it's a trick question. It was none of the above. It was actually Jesus who said, cast these unprofitable servants into outer darkness. Jesus said, and I paraphrased it originally, but Jesus said, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. A lot of preachers in the 21st century are asked, are you a hellfire and brimstone preacher? Well, Jesus was. One of the reasons why we do what we do is to keep people from ending up in hell. You know, we just celebrated Easter. You know what Easter is all about? Keeping people out of hell. You know why we host the war and many of our church members have teamed up with this group? It's to keep teenagers out of hell. The reason we publish gospel tracts and write op-eds in the Pensacola News Journal and get on WEAR and, and all of these things. And you hopefully are taking those tracts and, and communicating uh, to people about your faith. The reason we do these things is simple. It's to keep people out of hell. Um, Jesus believed in hell. I want you to see, and I'll give you this outline here at the beginning of the, the, the sermon I want you to see four ideas in Luke 16, 19 through 31. I want you to see a real place. I'm sorry, the first one is real people. Secondly, a real place. Thirdly, real punishment. And fourthly, a real promise. So real people, a real place, real punishment, and a real promise. Um. Many of you may be already saying, Pastor Johnson, I'm a Christian, and I don't need a sermon on hell. I already believe in hell. Um, well, let me suggest a few things. That a fresh understanding of hell will help Christian people appreciate their salvation so much the more. 
If you follow this content in this text, you track with me throughout this sermon, hopefully there will, there will come within your heart, again, a fresh appreciation for your salvation, a fresh appreciation for Christ, a fresh appreciation for the gospel, the good news, the glad tidings of Jesus. I'm saying this sermon is for Christians. Hopefully there will also be a, a stirring within the heart of a Christian, a, a motivation for Christians to be so much the more fervent when it comes to communicating what God has already done for you. So there's two reasons why. There is a third goal, certainly, to preach this text, and that is that an understanding of hell will alarm the unsaved person that is sitting here, that may be watching us live stream. Often the unsaved, when they understand what Jesus preached about hell, they are then awakened to the eternal benefits of belief in Christ. And so I just gave you three reasons to preach this text. Two of those were focused on the Christian. And so, dear Christian, don't just tune out because you're familiar with this text or because you already believe in hell. Instead, again, ask the Lord to speak to you. Consider with me the real people of Luke chapter 16, verse number 19. Notice it says there was a certain rich man. And then in verse 20, there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Some people try to dismiss this text as simply parabolic teaching. And yet a contrast is uh, that Jesus in his parables doesn't uh, use proper nouns primarily. He's not naming specific things, specific people. These are, this is a certain rich man. These are people that actually lived. Jesus in his parables is often uh, trying to communicate a truth and he does it with parabolic language and a truth specifically for his people. And yet here he is communicating truth that applies to people that actually live. This is an account of specifically true, a historic event. Specifically true things. Real people. There is a certain rich man who, as you followed along in the scripture reading and read the narrative, a certain rich man who died and went to hell. You find that in verse number 23, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. He died and went to hell. He's a real person. Um, and uh, people will uh, try to minimize what Jesus taught us about hell by saying that hell is not actually for people, but hell was created for uh, the devil and his angels. And it's true that hell was created originally uh, for the devil and his angels. That's Matthew 25, I think, verse number 41. However, Jesus also taught us that not only did the devil and his angels, these fallen angels, these legions of demons, not only do they reside in hell, and that, but, but in addition, Jesus warned us over and over that people also go to hell. Unbelievers, rejecters of Jesus. It's real people. Would you keep your place in Luke chapter 16 and go with me please to Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 9. Look at verse number 42. Sinners go to hell. What Mark 9, 42 is explaining. People, real people, people that have broken God's law, people that have transgressed the law of God, they've crossed the line. Notice what Jesus teaches here. If you have a red letter edition of the Bible, you see this in red letters. This is Jesus speaking. Mark chapter 9, verse 42, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believeth in me, it is better for him that a millstone were cast about his neck that, and he were cast into the sea. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. I mean, these are startling statements. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell. Um, so he's saying temporal discomfort is better than sin and the consequences of sin, which is eternal punishment. He's making a contrast here that seems startling in the temporal discomfort that's described, and yet what he wants his reader and his listener to understand is the severity of hell. 
Again, verse number 43, having two hands and uh, to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Verse number 45, and if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life, the temporal life, than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Verse 47, and if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Jesus is cautioning people, real people, concerning Sin and the offense that our sin is to a holy God. Real people die and go to a devil's hell. Go back to Luke chapter 16, please. Not only real people, but a real place. A real place. I referenced already verse number 23, where the text says, and in hell. Now, the Bible uses several different words to describe hell. Um, you find in the Old Testament, the idea of Sheol uh, is a reference to hell. In the Hebrew, in the New Testament, you find Hades, uh, you find Tartarus, you find Gehenna hell in the book of Revelation. Uh, it's the idea of the lake of fire. And I've preached before the differences between Hades and Gehenna. The fact is that the rich man in Luke chapter 16 is in Hades. He is still there today. And every, his soul is there. A difference between Gehenna and, and uh, Hades is the idea of it is in Gehenna, final resting place for the damned. It is both body and soul. Gehenna hell is synonymous with the lake of fire described in the book of Revelation. It is a, a real place. And it is there where the Bible says, Jesus says that this rich man is in hell. Um, go with me now, keep your place again in Luke 16, and go with me if you would to Matthew's gospel and consider this real place. Matthew chapter 5. We'll look at verse number 22. You know what Matthew 5, 6, and 7 include? A sermon from Jesus. Um, Jesus is the, the hellfire and brimstone preacher. He is preaching over and over in these chapters uh, concerning hell. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 22, here's what Jesus says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother Raka, it's the idea of calling him an empty head or a blockhead, uh, calling him names essentially, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Jesus is teaching again about a real place. Look over at verse number 29 of Matthew chapter 5. He says similar things to what's recorded in Mark chapter 9. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not thine whole body shall be cast into hell. If you're a note taker, I'll give you several other references. You could look also at chapter 7 of this uh, Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, verse number 13. You continue in Matthew's gospel, you'll read Jesus teaching about a real place called hell in Matthew chapter 8, verse number 12. Uh, very famously, Matthew chapter 10, verse number 28. Um, and Matthew chapter 13, verse number 42. Over and over and over again, Jesus preaches about a real place called hell. Back, please, with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 16. Real people die rejecting Christ and go to hell, that real place. But not only that, thirdly, this morning, it is a place of real punishment. And this may be where I spend most of my time this morning, this third idea of real punishment. 
punishment is indeed described in Luke chapter 16, 19 through 31. I mentioned already verse 23, the first part says, and in hell, but then notice the punishment that, that verse 23 describes. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes. Notice the phrase, and if you're in the habit of marking in your Bible, you might underline this phrase, being in torments, it says. We don't glory in such a thing. You say, Pastor, why would I underline such a, such a terrible idea? Well, because it helps us understand uh, the severity and the situation in hell. It gives us just a little bit of a glimpse. Um, several times in these few verses, the idea of, of punishment is, is given to us. Notice again in verse number 24. Verse number 24, and he cried, saying, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Notice this, for I'm tormented in this flame. Gives us again a picture of the torment in hell with the, with the word flame. Um, not only there, but notice verse number 28. The rich man is concerned about those still on the earth. And he's in hell, and from hell he says, for I have five brethren that uh, he, he wants, he, he wants uh, Abraham you know, to send uh, Lazarus, uh, to, to warn, to send someone to warn these that are still on the earth. He says, lest they also come, notice this, into this place of torment. He doesn't want anybody to face the punishment that he is presently undergoing. It's a place of punishment. It's real people. It's a real place. And the idea of place is also in verse number 28, into this place of torment. And that word torment gives us this idea of punishment. And all of it is real. For hell is, un it is the abode of the damned. Now, I know that if you're a member of North Stone Baptist Church, I am generally am preaching to those that agree with uh, the pastor or agree with the teaching that would typically come from this pulpit. I am speaking to many of you who would be considered in the amen section. You uh, agree with the truths that are delivered here. And yet, there is a controversy that uh, is, is looming in the theological world concerning what the Bible indicates about hell. And, and that's why it's important for us to understand the real punishments involved in, in hell. And to see, uh, that's why I suggested underlining the idea of torments uh, at least three times in this uh, simple account. And the idea of flame. The best definition I've ever heard on what hell is from a biblical standpoint is this. It's a little lengthy if you're a note taker um, and you can't get it all down, see me afterwards and I'll give it to you. One of my Bible college professors gave me this, and I find it to be refreshingly biblical. Here's what he said. Hell is the ultimate destination where Christ-rejecting men and women experience eternal, did you hear the word eternal? And then conscious, the idea of they know what's going on, uh, eternal, conscious, torment in fire that is nothing less than literal. It's a definition of hell. Why is that so important? Well, because there's people under the broad tent known as evangelicalism that would reject that definition and frankly reject the teachings of Jesus and they would cling to an idea known as annihilationism. Annihilationism is the idea that it's not eternal punishment in hell, but that your soul is annihilated and that there is some reprieve to the punishment. We would reject the idea of annihilationism simply on the basis that over and over Jesus used the word eternal and everlasting. Not only annihilationism, but then there's this very popular idea, more and more popular idea known as universalism. And Rob Bell is a famous universalistic preacher. He wrote a famous book, a best-selling book entitled Love Wins. The coffee shop I go to just about every afternoon is also a little bookstore, and they have, um, they have lots of, of anti-God, frankly, and, and liberal um, authors in there. Uh, and then the only couple Christian people that, they'll, that they've got in their little bookstore are people like Rob Bell. His latest book, I don't even know what it is, his first book, the famous book, one of his first books was Love Wins. And it's in that book uh, where he deals, with, um, he deals with universalism. And his point is, that love wins and so everybody eventually goes to heaven, universally. Whether they believe in Jesus or not, 
That's what universalism teaches. You know a better title, a more biblical title to his book? But it won't sell as many copies, but is, uh, is Holiness Wins. Now think about that. Because the fact is God is holy and and there is no way that, that sinful man can go into heaven without contaminating it unless they're washed in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. Holiness wins. In the end, if you say, no, I refuse the substitutionary atonement of Jesus, I reject Christ. Well, what happens? God's holiness wins. Then people spend eternity in hell. Um, these are sobering thoughts for sure. It is, a, it, is, it is real punishment. So we reject annihilationism because Jesus rejected it. We reject the idea of universalism. Another idea is this idea of conditionalism. I won't unpack all these ideas. I actually did uh, unpack these ideas about three years ago preaching on this topic. Some of you may recall that. It's on Sermon Audio. I refer you to that if you'd like more depth on these things. So these are what I would say are understatements about hell. You know, they minimize the punishment in hell or say that it basically doesn't even exist. Um, understatements, but we would also reject overstatements about hell um, and about specifically the punishment in hell. Uh, some of the early church fathers wrote incorrectly that it's in hell where blasphemers are hanging by their tongues. They've said that in hell, adulterous women are dangling over boiling mire. Some have wrote that in hell, slanderers are chewing on their own tongues. They wrote also that in hell, murderers are being hurled into pits of venomous snakes. None of that's in the Bible either. So we reject understatements as well as overstatements about hell, about the punishment in hell. And what do we accept? except what Jesus taught us. And the best summary I have seen is that definition I gave you from my Bible college professor, that hell is the ultimate destination where Christ rejecting men. Listen, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He desires that you receive his love that is represented through Jesus Christ. But you are a volitional creature. Um, you can choose whether or not you want to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. You can choose if you're going to love your neighbor as yourself. You can choose uh, to uh, embrace the substitutionary atonement. Our brother walked us through Isaiah 53 last night when he was preaching to those teenagers. And, and the substitutionary atonement is described there. And read uh, a, a verse like 2 Corinthians 5.21, the one that knew no sin became sin for us. Uh, you reject the substitutionary atonement, the one that was sinless, died for sinners. And what happens? You die and, and go to that ultimate destination where Christ rejecting men and women experience eternal, conscious torment in fire that is nothing less than literal. So reject the understatements, reject the overstatements, and consider these aspects. Uh, some years ago, I think it was uh, May of 1989, 650 evangelical scholars got together. These are leaders, pastors, uh, notable names included Charles Colston and J.I. Packer and D.A. Carson. They were among the 650. Some good men were gathered there, some uh, we would say we would strongly disagree with. So what I'm about to describe is not necessarily an indication on the uh, theological credibility of, of, of any of the people I just mentioned. Uh, but what came out of this four-day meeting back in May of 1989 with these 650 scholars was a 535-page publication known as Evangelical Affirmations. So what did these scholars affirm? And really their goal was uh, to try to define what you must believe if you're going to use the term evangelical to describe yourself or your church. Um, and th that word nowadays for sure is just thrown around very liberally. Uh, the evangelical voter, you know, politicians want the evangelical vote. And so, uh, and so they'll kind of sometimes cater or coddle to evangelical voters uh, hoping to get our vote. And there is a, again, it's a broad general term. There's a big base of Americans that would say, I'm an evangelical. Well, what do you have to affirm 
to be an evangelical. And these scholars get together and they debate it. And there is a section, it's page 36, um, the section called Judgment. And so how did they define hell? Here's what they come, came up with. They said unbelievers will be separate eternally, separated eternally from God. And they said concern for evangelism should not be compromised by any illusion that all will be finally saved. Um, so there are aspects of that statement that are reasonable. It's not a terrible statement, but do you notice the things that are missing? Again, the Bible college professor, the, the definition that I think is a terrific definition. What's missing from the evangelical affirmation statement is the idea of eternality, the idea of, of consciousness, the idea of torment in fire that is nothing less than literal. All of those things are things Jesus taught. And there is a growing idea to just minimize hell because, because it turns people off, you know. Um, it, it's not going to necessarily get money in the offering plate or, or people in the pews. And yet, to, to, to withhold teachings on hell is again to be unchrist like or to minimize the, defin the biblical definition of hell for the sake of everybody else that wants to call themselves an evangelical. Really, what it is, it's just compromise. And it's sad. Um, so, hell is a place of real punishment. I, I said at the outset of this that there are several reasons why we should, we should revisit this topic. Because a fresh understanding on hell will help Christians appreciate that they're not going there. Because of, it should give you a fresh appreciation of your salvation and what Jesus did for you. the lawbreaker that you, that you are before you were robed in the righteousness of Christ. And it should make you say, thank you, Lord. Um, I don't have to go to that place that is literal, that is eternal, that is a place of fire, that is a place where the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. And then again, it should give us this zeal. To, it should motivate Christian people to share the gospel with others. And then if you're here and you've heard this description on hell, and you don't have a point of conversion where you realize, hey, I am a sinner. I, I have lied. I have lusted. I, I am guilty. Then, then you're sitting here and you'd say, I know I'm a sinner and I know I need a Savior. I know I need a spotless lamb. I know I need Jesus. I'm telling you that today is the day that you trust Jesus before it is, listen to this, eternally too late. Um, I close with this illustration. My time is gone. Um, I feel I have so much more I could say, but um, it was December of 1984 when there was an accident on the freeway. It's actually a freeway in London, uh, South Wales. A big accident. Uh, a truck was carrying paper, and that truck... Had, it ran into something, had some kind of an accident, and it was on that morning where there was significant fog. And the fog was so serious that uh, police were out there already trying to deter accidents from happening. Uh, they had hazard signs up, and uh, they had cones out. And uh, in spite of all that they had done, uh, this big truck, all this paper, the heavy weight of it, the thick fog, the truck gets in an accident. Well, it's a freeway. People are going very, very, very quickly. And sure enough, other cars started to collide and a huge pileup of cars. Um, and the police were uh, extremely concerned, passionate about trying to stop people from continuing down the freeway. And, and they felt very helpless in the moment the fog is so thick that people cannot see the pileup. So the newspaper reports that police officers with tears in their eyes were picking up cones and hurling them at automobiles to try to get their attention, to try to get them to stop. I'm saying, dear Christian, the task is similar for us. That's why we have the war. That's why we have event evangelism. That's why we have gospel tracts. They're all like cones we're throwing at people. 
trying to say, don't head that way. 20 people that died in that, in that accident. And the newspaper did report that those police had tears running down their cheeks. Do you still weep for the lost? Do you still rejoice in the promise of heaven? Lazarus, he's thrilled to be where he is. And the rich man, he would send you, you know. He wanted to send others to his five brethren. I give you the last idea. I know I said I would close, but you know I'm a Baptist preacher. But anyways, uh, look over at Luke chapter 23. I want you to see quickly the real promise. The real promise. We're in Luke's gospel already. Look over just a few pages. So Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom. It's a euphemism, a synonym for heaven. Another synonym for heaven is in Luke chapter 23, the idea of paradise. It speaks of the real promise, the real promise. Notice, this is Jesus with the thieves on the cross. The Bible uses the word malefactor, verse number 39 of Luke 23. And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, if, by the way, if you're in the habit of marking in your Bible, you might underline that word, if, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. So one of the thieves hollers this at the man in the middle, Jesus. If you're really the Christ, save yourself and save us. But then the other thief answering, he rebuked the guy across the way. He rebuked him saying, dost not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? Why did he rebuke him? He rebuked him for that word if, because that word if represents his lack of faith. Uh, it would be better said since <laughs> thou art the Christ. But the one thief didn't have the faith. If you're really uh, the Christ, he rebukes him for his lack of faith and he also rebukes him for his irreverent level of selfishness. This idea of if thou art the Christ is the same stuff the religious elite were saying to Jesus when they reviled him. It's irreverent and it's selfish. He's really the one malefactor saying, if you're the Christ, then, then save yourself, but save me, save us. Get us down from here. But the other answering rebuked and said, dost thou not fear God? It's irreverent to holler such things because the man in the middle is clearly God. That's, that's what he understood, the one malefactor understands. Seeing that thou art in the same condemnation, verse number 41, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. They, they know they were criminals. Malefactor is not just stealing a candy from a, a, a gas station, you know, chocolate bar. But this is people robbing with murderous intent. Very likely they have murdered people. And the man, the, the one thief, the one malefactor, he, he says, look, we deserve to die like criminals. It's the due reward of the deeds. But! This man, the one in the middle, hath done nothing amiss, nothing wrong. Over and over, the Bible records that he was sinless. Verse number 42, and he said unto Jesus, now notice this word. He said, Lord, speaks to his faith. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And here's this promise, this real promise. Because of his expression of faith, because of his expression of belief. Verse 43, Jesus says unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Sinners. One rejecting, one accepting. If you're a Christian, you rejoice in the day that you believe, that you accept it. And if you're here and you don't know the Lord, today is the day of salvation. Would you pray with me, please?